Good morning. I'm uh, very happy to be here and um, thank you very much to Zainab for uh, reaching out. I'm going to talk to you about lessons from database failures. I'm also um, fairly severely jet lagged and the heat hasn't helped. <laughs> um, I work on MariaDB server and have been since the start when we did it at Monty Program and I've been in the MySQL world basically hacking on MySQL for more than 10 years and using it for probably more than 15 years. Also worked on Fedora and OpenOffice and a couple years ago I even won an award. So these slides were prepared um, a little earlier, but uh, I couldn't help but resist uh, putting this slide here. This, this actually was probably a quite famous uh, post from yesterday where this guy said he basically RM-RF'd his entire root directory, including his backups um, and all mounted storage. So it turns out, I've never seen this in production, but this guy's little hosting company is officially hosed due to a scripting error. My rough agenda today is to talk to you a little bit about backups and uh, verification of those backups. So basically, having offsite backups make sense so you don't rm-rf slash everything, right? Also talk to you about replication and failover. A lot of people tend to believe MySQL maybe is a toy database or doesn't do many things as one would expect, but replication has been one of the key reasons why MySQL has actually become fairly popular and used at fairly large sites. I mean, if you look at the top 20 websites today, 18 of the 20, according to the Alexa ranking, are powered by MySQL or MariaDB or some variant of MySQL and the other two are actually owned by Microsoft, so presumably they run SQL Server. And uh, the other thing that's fairly new, I'd say maybe only in production use for about six to eight months, would be security and encryption. Security's been around obviously for quite some time, but uh, the ability to encrypt stuff is fairly new in the MySQL uh, ecosystem. So I'll start off with a site called Magnolia. Does anybody remember this or ha has anybody used this before? Can I get a show of hands maybe? Hmm, not many. What about Delicious? Okay, so a lot more people use Delicious than Magnolia. But Magnolia probably started a little earlier. It, you know, it conformed to open standards. It had microformats. It started around 10 years ago. They also had a paid component to Magnolia, whereas Delicious generally was uh, free for all. And uh, according to the postmortem anyway, they never made any profits. And here's the funny thing about postmortems. Something as new, new as Magnolia, I mean, it only you know, probably shut down in 2009. You can barely find information on the internet anymore about Magnolia and why it, it, shut, it shut down. In fact, if you Google carefully, you, I found an old blog post of myself actually which is kind of shocking. So they had a complete outage at the end of January 2009, and uh, about a couple of weeks later, they realized they had data corruption to the entire UDB, the user database, and they basically said they were essentially dead. They tried very hard to come back, and uh, that didn't happen. So by September 2010, I believe they said, you know, that we're completely out of business. Your bookmarks are mostly hosed if they weren't saved in the archives. And Delicious basically won. I mean, Yahoo then acquired them. I, I, well, I don't know if you can say they won by Yahoo acquiring them. Um, but then, you know, P Pinboard came along as well and so forth. Um, what happened? Turns out they had um, a couple of XServes that they were running the service on and uh, they used some Intel uh, self-hosted Mac minis as front-end servers. They only had a half terabyte MySQL database. It was MySQL 5 back in the day. And uh, it turns out they had file system corruption. So running your database on a HFS plus file system in production is probably not the wisest choice. 
I mean, if you see lots of uh, database benchmarks uh, uh, that are run on Macs, so they also tend to maybe even turn off F-Sync. And yeah, of course, databases are extremely fast when you turn off F-Sync or you run on a file system that is you know, not uh, battle-tested, like XFS or ext4. So they already had file system corruption, and that also then led to a corrupted database backup, so they weren't obviously testing this. Turns out that the other thing they did was they made use of rsync to back up the database over a firewire network, and rsync is great for static data, but the DB is constantly changing, so why would you use rsync to do that? We never did find out if they used MyISM or InnoDB, though speculation from most of us would say that they did likely use MyISM, so they should have probably used a transactional store. And, you know, how would you do it today? If you were going to start a Pinboard equivalent or a Magnolia equivalent, what would you do today? Well, for one, I'd probably just launch it in something like EC2, and then I'd use EBS snapshots to make sure that that's being backed up. And then I'd store the database in RDS, and I'd also use snapshotting there. And I'd probably also have multi-AZ deployments. And I might be able to actually start a service like Magnolia, even on Amazon's free tier, if I write code well, at least for the first year. But, we're at RootCon, so let's presume you're going to want to self-host all of this. For one, backups. I would definitely use something like extra backup. How many of you use MySQL and don't use extra backup? Okay, that's quite a number of you. So extra backup is really good, and if you happen to use extra DB, which is the modified version of InnoDB, that ships in MariaDB and Pocona server, you'll realize that there is this additional feature known as bitmap change page tracking. This allows you to actually just look for change pages in the backups and make backups of change pages. So you're kind of getting more efficient backups than just entire page backups. Extra backup is definitely proven. It's battle tested. People use it in production every day. Another thing, I would highly recommend is if you were going to maybe provision a new slave, and you probably do want to provision slaves for, for replicas, is to use something like MySQL dump with single transaction and master data with the option to actually execute the transaction completely as start transaction with consistent snapshot. This does not work with stock MySQL even up to 5.7, but it does work in Pocona server and MariaDB because this is a byproduct of the way we implemented group commit in the binary lock. If you happen to be still using just regular MySQL, you will still have to run flush tables with read lock and then only do a MySQL dump with a single transaction. Now, naturally, you don't want to do that too often, so upgrade your servers. Another thing that I would say is a good thing to do is probably is to back up your replica. You don't want to you know, add more load to your masters. You definitely want to do that off a slave. And replication event checksums have been in the MySQL world since MySQL 5.6 and MariaDB 5.3, both of which came out around the 2011-2012 mark. It's 2016 now. If you're not running event checksums, this is obviously not a very good thing for you. And this would have prevented Magnolia's um, problems overall because basically checksums are written to binary logs as well as relay logs, and they're checked at various points. And when they see an error, either caused by memory, disk, or network failures, they will actually stop replication immediately uh, based on checksums. And you can choose where to run the checksums. You can either verify them on the master, you can verify them on the slave. Choice is up to you. But running this has fairly little overhead, but it's extremely good to make sure you're not actually replicating crap. And you can easily replicate crap if you don't know what you're replicating. I mean, if you're running statement-based replication today, and there are you know, changes to um, UUIDs and so forth, you may actually realize you are replicating crap after a while, which is why the default for a fairly long time has been mixed mode replication, 
where things that were likely to change would switch from statement to um, row-based replication. And today, more and more, I, rec I would probably recommend you to just run row-based replication unless you know why you want to run statement-based replication. Row-based is, by and large, the default today, and there is really no reason not to run it. Now, now, if Walter was in the audience, he might actually laugh a little bit well at, at this because um, Couchsurfing basically almost said they were going to close in 2006. TechCrunch wrote an article saying that they were now sent to Deadpool. And it turns out that it was because the database administrator made some critical mistakes and uh, avoidable hard drive crash, but they also did some things that you know, equated to dropping stuff that they shouldn't have dropped. And Couchsurfing is still around today, I guess. Does anybody use Couchsurfing here? OK, not many. How many use Airbnb? A lot more. OK, so Couchsurfing probably survived because Airbnb wasn't around in 2006. But had Airbnb been around, I guess it would probably have died. And one of those things that would have made you avoid this would be to actually run time-delayed replication. You can basically implement this on a, it's a, on a per slave level, so it holds the SQL thread. So the replication delay on one slave user could uh, configure multiple slaves to apply replication. And you basically have this since MySQL 5.6. So since 2012, you have been able to actually state that one slave is now maybe 10 minutes behind, two hours behind, and so forth. And this is intentional, so that if a DBA does make mistakes, you can actually get around from those mistakes. I'd really like to draw your attention to how long it does take to make these features happen. So time-delayed replication wasn't an option for Couchsurfing, but it is an option for you today. I mean, this feature was suggested in 2001, long before MySQL had you know, sensible replication. There was a bug opened in 2006. It was pushed to a tree in 2010, so a four-year delay. And it was only available in a GA release three years later, which is pretty long if you think about it. So yes, there are features that people will find useful that may not, may not have existed back then. But if you're starting out today or you're you know, rolling out a database today, you should be using the features of today's database and not be biased by yesterday's problems. So why replicate? The easy reason is to scale out. A lot of people think about the whole master-slave methodology as a way to just have more read capacity, basically. And today, with global transaction IDs, you could have multi-master setups to even have you know, better write uh, scale out. Then another one is failover. Failover is a fairly common uh, topic. When your master goes down, you'd like to fail over to the most current slave, and that slave should become the new master. Now, you may want this to be automatic, or you may want this to be manual, and we'll talk about that going forward as well. Another common uh, problem is geographical redundancy across multiple data centers. Now, replication and having multiple data centers is important because you know, your data centers can get flooded, they can actually go up in smoke due to fire. And uh, I wanted to take a clipping about why this makes sense, but most of those articles were in the Korean language. So how many here use Samsung devices? Not so many. OK, so if you happen to have a, had a Samsung smart TV, or you, know, you have a Samsung device which has all these S apps that sync with Samsung, about April, two years ago, you'd have realized that on a Sunday, you could not actually make use of your smart TV, or all these S apps would die. And it so happened I was in Seoul, South Korea then as well, and my Amex wouldn't work either, because Samsung has the rights to Amex in Korea. It turns out that their Ilsan data center caught fire. And because it caught fire and they weren't replicating to multiple data centers, you couldn't effectively use your smart TV, your S services were down, and for nearly a week, I couldn't charge my Amex in Korea. So I had to go back to using like a Visa, which is kind of awful. 
So geographical redundancies across multiple data centers make a lot of sense. And today with you know, cloud and uh, the idea that you may want to do it in, in a hybrid fashion, Amazon, Rackspace, they all allow you to just open up accounts and have multiple data centers across you know, continents. And then the other one as to why you'd like to replicate would be online schema change. You know, MySQL 5.6 supports online DDL, and you know, large DDL operations may cause la replication lag. But there is a tool, you know, PT Online Schema Change does non-blocking alter tables, and people do want to change their schemas in production today. And I'm happy to say that we don't really find many failures being reported up with PT Online Schema Change. We've seen, you know, positive stories from the UK Government Digital Service, Task Rabbit, um, Wikimedia. Wikipedia uses this with you know, the MariaDB servers, Basecamp from 37 Signals, um, OpenStack deployments talk about PT Online Schema Change. And this was actually, you know, it became very famous largely because Facebook took something called Oak Online Alter and released Facebook OCS. Facebook were probably the first largest deployment of MySQL to do online schema changes and then came PT Online Schema Change, which became a lot more mainstream. So there's, there are fairly good blog posts um, from Facebook's Mark Callahan about how they did online schema change. Of course, if you're looking for a Facebook blog post, this must mean you also have a Facebook account, because you have to read it on Facebook. So, types of replication. We've had asynchronous replication for the longest time, right? This is the default, and it's fast. I mean, you can commit in 20 milliseconds, 30 milliseconds, and you know, you're, you're, you're good to go. Your master will get it. You have no idea if your slave received it, but you're pretty much good to go. Then we have semi-synchronous, since 5.5 as a plugin. And semi-synchronous is generally, I, I would say, how very large sites tend to run MySQL. The very first people to make a semi-sync plugin available was from the Google tree of MySQL. They had a patch available in the, since the MySQL 5.0 days, and it was probably running semi-sync since 2007 or 8. Facebook also runs with semi-sync, and we've improved semi-sync in the sense that it is now enhanced and lossless, because it turns out that the way we would do semi-sync before you would actually commit to InnoDB, and a master may crash, and none of the slaves may have received the data because based on the way it was being written, um, so your, but your applications may see them. So previous versions of semi-sync actually occasionally suffered from this, this idea of phantom reads. But the idea of lossless semi-sync is that we would only commit Inno, to InnoDB after getting an ACK from one of the semi-sync slaves and actually this surprisingly does not degrade performance either. So now you're commit so only data that is committed on at least one slave is now visible through applications. And I think this is a, a huge, huge uh, gain in getting semi-sync out there. So this is available in MySQL 5.7, Percona Server 5.7, and MariaDB 10.1. So this is what we call enhanced lossless semi-sync. And semi-sync by and large is how most large deployments today tend to run. Then there's also the idea of fully synchronous replication. And this is you know, not completely new. I mean, we've had this idea of, from NDB cluster, or commonly known as MySQL cluster, for a fairly long time. It's just that NDB cluster is extremely complex to set up, requires a minimum of five nodes, which has one management node, and it's typically only used for in the telco world. You know, upgrading NDB cluster in the old days used to basically mean you type 54 commands or something to that effect, just to upgrade your cluster. But it was very, very highly available and fault tolerant. In fact, most of your um, cell phones and your cell phone providers, they have these uh, home location recorders at cell towers. Most of them tend to be powered by NDB cluster because they need to know where you are and you. And when you're changing cells, they need to also inform the, the database that you've, you've changed cells. So NDB cluster, hard to set up, doesn't use InnoDB, 
So what were the other alternatives? Galera has been around for about six years. Does anybody run Galera cluster or ExtraDB cluster? In? All right, a bunch of you, excellent. Now, Galera is obviously fully synchronous replication, so it basically means that all nodes are the same or the transaction gets rolled back. Um, not to be left out, MySQL, based on the same exact paper, decided, well, Galera looks like it's getting some steam. I mean, lots of people from PagerDuty, AVG, et cetera, make use of it, including they recommend this for OpenStack deployments to some extent. They said, let's try this thing called group replication. Group replication today is still very much, I would say, beta quality, and it's not released against any MySQL release, but it's well worth watching because it makes use of fully synchronous replication as well. Early versions made use of things like Corosync, but they've gotten rid of it. And one of the cool things about group replication that Galera doesn't do is that if you happen to run Windows, you could run group replication there. Now, does anybody run Windows in production? I thought so. And then there's DRBD, the idea of RAID over Ethernet or distributed replication block device. DRBD was probably great tech for MySQL back in you know, 2007 when we didn't have as robust replication and it required you to actually replicate blocks across the network. This is likely still how Amazon's multi-AZ is deployed for, for one. We, we obviously don't know, but we can guess based on performance numbers. But today, I really don't think you need to you know, use DRBD and have you know, a passive master just waiting to take over. Having a passive master just waiting to take over is you know, burning up your data center resources because you can't actually do anything with it. And many people then say, oh, well, why don't we do cross DRBD, right? So the passive master is now also a master for a certain set of data. Well, then you don't really have that much high availability. So there are a bunch of frameworks to make your life better. There is this thing called MySQL MMM that was fairly popular also probably about you know, eight years ago. If you go to the website, it tells you, do not use this. You should probably listen to them. It is fairly easy to set up, but it's also fairly easy for something to go wrong fairly quickly. So don't use it. Then there is several lines cluster control. This one's a great piece of you know, GUI software. You, know, you can set up a four node cluster in less than you know, five minutes. It does Galera, it supports semi-sync. You can do an automated failover, a manual failover. You can set up HA proxy. You can you know, do um, you know, on-prem, off-prem hybrid, do simulations of workloads, hot backups. But these, these, these folk, uh, also I, I'd say probably don't use them largely because you know, they charge you a license fee. They give you a two week trial version, which is crazy in the open source world. Though they do obviously have customers from what I gather. My personal favorite is Orchestrator. And um, this one's written in Go, it was written at Outbrain by Shlomi Noah who now actually works at GitHub, and uh, he was in the middle of it, he was working on it at booking.com, and many people actually end up using this. I think um, Etsy uses this now as well, actually. So th this one's got much use in multiple places. It does, read, you know, it'll read your topologies, it'll monitor state, it'll poll, you can modify your topologies, that's really important, right? Moving replication around, it has a GUI, it has a JSON API, you can you know, visualize issues, you can kill long running queries. This is open source, this is easy to install, this is easy to use, this is what I would recommend you to actually make use of. There's also MySQL MHA, and you can tie MHA in to Orchestrator. MHA is known as MySQL High Availability. It's a set of Perl scripts. I know maybe not many people still write Perl, but I do. And uh, I didn't write this, but I do contribute to it. It was um, created at DNA, and it's actually today used in multiple places, like you know the SK Telecom Group, um, Jetair in Belgium, and um, oh yeah, the big one, Facebook. Facebook uses this as well. So MHA is a tool to monitor your master and slave topologies. You can have N-tier slaves, so slaves of slaves and it'll allow you to do an automatic failover or a manual failover if you want to do something like an online schema change, and all of this is fairly easily configurable. So I'd say 
definitely use MHA. You can get started with MHA in production with testing in probably less than 20 hours with scripting. Then there's Tungsten Replicator. Most of this is open source, except for their geographical redundancy tools where they then want to sell you something. It was actually made by Continuant. VMware ended up picking it up a couple of years ago, and you can still get it today. Um, not quite my choice of tool, but I should mention it for you know uh, posterity's sake and also completeness because some people do use it. We've heard you know large customers for them include people like Zappos and Box.net. I don't personally like this because it makes use of a uh, Java API and it instead of using just regular binary logs, it parses the binary logs and converts them into what is known as a transactional history log, a THL. And if you look at the network traffic of a THL, it's almost double the size of you know your transaction in a bin log. So you're actually extremely chatty. And then if you use 5.6 and greater, you'll realize it actually comes with tools like MySQL failover and MySQL RPM, R RPL admin. This of course requires you to, to, have, to have a GTID enabled uh, topology. And um, it turns out there are many people that end up using this, and lately one of the people that did case studies for this was, a, was an open source mail app called Nylas, and uh, they make use of MySQL failover. One of the uh, caveats of using this is that you need to turn on log slave updates, which also means that you end up using a lot more space. One of the cool things it does is that it does fail back, which means that if your node rejoins the cluster when it's come back up again, it just rejoins as a slave and it has automatic topology discovery, so it rejoins as a slave and then you can you know, promote it to a master later as well. There's Pocona Replication Manager, and this one makes use of things uh, from the Linux HA stack, you know, the heartbeat, pacemaker, or chorusync. And we will we'll talk a little bit more about this later because we have a little bit of a case study around it. Now, this is great if you also happen to be a Linux admin, but uh, if you were just like a DBA, this one's much harder to use in my opinion. There's also now MariaDB Replication Manager. It's uh, fairly new. I don't believe it has production users. Uh, it's aimed to be like MHA, but with MariaDB's GTID. So, case study, GitHub. Anybody here from GitHub? Anybody here use GitHub? <laughs> okay. So this is all public, okay? It turns out GitHub, a couple of years ago, went down and maybe your productivity increased tremendously when it was down, because you weren't starring projects, filing issues, etc. So they were replacing DRBD with PRM and a pacemaker resource agent. This meant that it would get more efficient failovers, as they say in that uh, abstract. Um, for one, DRBD wasn't really working for them because you know, once you did have a failover, you'd have an extremely cold buffer pool and you'd have to actually warm that buffer pool up. This is a painful process when your buffer pool is you know, 64 gigs in size, 128 gigs in size, people are getting larger servers. Now, there's, there is a little solution in both Pocona Server and MariaDB known as InnoDB fake changes. And there is the idea of replication prefetching as well. And it basically replaces statements from the relay log and then it will manually convert them uh, so basically co converts commits to rollbacks. But nobody really likes to actually make use of these fake changes uh, so often in production because you know, we consider this feature beta quality. So for them, moving to something like PRM made sense. However, when there's poor performance, one of the quantums of PRM would then lead to failing tests. And because you're having load and you're failing tests and health checks, this would actually trigger a failover. What actually happens is failovers then start triggering more failovers. Long story short, they realized that once they had fail failovers being, you know, triggering more failovers, they had to stop running Pacemaker, they had to stop running PRM. But the one thing that I'd love to bring to you here is that they also decided that automated failover was probably not for them. In many situations, they would not have actually done this had an admin been involved. 
So they've made changes to the pacemaker configuration to ensure failover of the active database role will only occur when initiated by a member of our ops team. And it turns out this is a fairly sensible way of doing failovers. People love the idea of automatic failovers, but you may occasionally have multiple automatic failovers. And you can read about it in this very nice tear down here. So, fully automated failovers. Can it be a good idea though? Sometimes you get false, al false alarms. This will actually get, basically give you short downtime, but also restart all your write connections. It's kind of annoying. This whole idea of repeated failover, you know, failovers triggering failovers, this is, this is awful. Which is why MHA, from the very get go, had this thing where it says you wouldn't allow a failover if a failover had occurred in the last eight hours. This would prevent a failover triggering a failover. So overloaded servers, not a problem. Unless you set the last failover min and that n can be set to something lower if you like. Sometimes you'll also notice that you may lose data, right? So what happens if you, you know, triggered a failover automatically and you weren't using semi-synchronous replication? This could be a problem. But today, we have, you know, semi-sync and we have group commit in the binary log. Now, you can turn on sync bin log equals one and indb flush log at transaction commit equals one and find no performance penalty. So, you know, InnoDB with those options satisfies the D in S that it is fully durable. The other problem is split brain. Sometimes power off takes a long time. Sometimes the network basically says, oh, you know, it's flaky from the monitoring node to the master. But maybe the slave still sees it and you didn't, you know, execute power off. Which is why a tool like MHA actually has what is known as a secondary check script, which allows you to actually use another network interface, use a slave to see if, the, if, if it sees the master, and then it would not trigger a failover but a warning for you. So um, you definitely want to avoid things like split brain. So at many, many large places, you know, and there have been presentations about this, you know, even my, my favorite example going back to Facebook is they use global transaction IDs, but they don't do automated failovers. They actually ask an op. It is all not automated. All right. So let's talk a little bit about proxies. How many of you have heard of MaxScale before? No, oh, well, very few. MaxScale is basically what I'd call a pluggable router. You can do, you know, connection and statement-based load balancing. You can use it for logging. You can write to other databases, uh, backends besides MySQL if you write your own filter. So Percona wrote a Kafka plugin, which can allow you to actually push data into Kafka. You can also prevent SQL injections. Uh, you can route queries via hints. You can rewrite queries. You can have a binary log a relay. You can even do schema-based sharding. And one of the large use cases for MaxScale would be a binary log server. Now, Booking.com. Anybody use Booking.com to book hotel rooms? Okay. So they run a huge MySQL and MariaDB installation, and they also obviously have MaxScale. And they also still use Perl, for what it's worth. And uh, they replace the intermediate masters by actually ba basically having MaxScale ship bin logs to slaves. And uh, this is actually uh, a way to get rid of intermediate masters. And you can also then ship archives of bin logs to other uh, places like you know, HDFS. So you can keep uh, data there. And you want to get long-term backups, you can get it from there as well. And a very popular use case for MaxScale, besides having HA proxy do load balancing of Galera clusters, is to actually use MaxScale. And why? Why MaxScale? I mean, it's GPL and all that, but the most important thing is that it understands the MySQL protocol. So it, HA proxy doesn't understand it, and you actually need to have a proxy user inside your database to actually pass those commands. So it's kind, definitely kind of useful to, to use that. Then there is the option of MySQL router and fabric. Now this, is, this one's actually interesting because this is also fairly new. We don't see as many people uptaking it, though we've heard people like Dropbox say they're trying it out. It definitely requires you to turn on global transaction ID, and you need what is known as a fabric-aware connector. 
A fabric aware connector is basically a connector that understands that fabric, fabric is there. So it's all the modern MySQL connectors generally support it. And it's also worth noting that some modern MySQL connectors, say the connector J, the MySQL ND for PHP, and the MariaDB Java connector, they all support load balancing within the connector as well. So you can actually state a bunch of IPs that you're planning to use or, or a pool and actually use that from even within the connector without using frameworks like this. And then there's also proxy SQL. This is uh, written by one chap who uh, works at Dropbox and uh, another good use user and use case for this would be Nylas, the one I just recommended. And the thing that this one does over, say, something like MaxScale or even Router and Fabric is that not only does it handle persistent connections fairly well, it does query caching. So if you're actually doing caching inside the proxy layer, you actually realize that you're probably getting a lot better performance, especially in benchmarks. It may not be true in real world, but in benchmarks, your benchmark queries are most likely cached anyway. So, I thought I'd throw in a little bit of Malaysia and offer you a piece of a durian. It's, one of my, it's actually one of my favorite fruits. Do you eat durians? I don't know. You don't get them here, okay. Well, you should all now go to Thailand or Malaysia and try some durian. <laughs> but why, why do I have a picture of durian up here? It's because it's, it looks like it's sharded. And, you know, sharding is a database concept that basically it's like you partition data and you put it on different uh, machines. Uh, have the idea that not all data lives in one place. You basically hash records to partitions. You can choose to either partition alphabetically. You can put a whole bunch of users per shard. You can, you know, even partition your schema in a way that says, you know, I want to organize, say, by something crazy like postal codes and so forth. And Sharding is also important, because, and, and why you need frameworks for sharding is because you also want to move content between shards. You also want to reshard because when a shard goes down, you don't want the data on that shard to be, you know, gone. And you also may, may need to regularly split shards because a shard gets too big. Let's say, you know, there are 400 users storing photos and I suddenly decide to upload my 10-year archive. Maybe I need to be rebalanced off the shard or you know, push other users off said shard. So there are multiple ways to do sharding. One of them is the spider storage engine. You can either compile this from MySQL or get this stock inside of MariaDB server. And this handles shards by using InnoDB as a backend. So your application just connects to one MariaDB server and, it, and spider automatically divides it to have multiple backends based on what you've configured it. So you can maybe have 32 backend servers, all powered by NADB, but looking like one very large database to your app. Tungsten also does sharding out of the box, makes use of a JMX bean. Um, obviously, it makes use of its transactional history log as well, and it can do sharding for you in the open source version as well. And then one of the most famous ones that's written in Ruby would be JetPants from Tumblr. This one allows you to clone replicas. It allows you to also do online shard rebalancing. You can promote masters. You can do range-based sharding. And it makes use of, when it's creating a new node, it makes use of multi-source replication. And for the longest time, multi-source replication was only available in MariaDB 10 and greater but MySQL 5.7 now has the ability for you to do multi-source as well. So make use of new technology again. And one of the most interesting battle-tested versions of sharding today is Vitesse. Vitesse is what make, ensures that when you go to YouTube, you actually watch your videos. You don't get angry that you can't see videos. You, can't, you want to take videos offline, it's, Vitesse it's also Vitesse telling you that. Every MySQL connection opens up one thread, one thread per connection, unless you use a thread pool. And that can easily eat up anywhere between 256 kilobytes of RAM to maybe even three megs of RAM. Vitesse, on the other hand, makes use of uh, BSON connections. They're limited to 32 kilobytes of RAM. 
and the connection pooling is all handled via Go. I say it has MariaDB support too, and if it wasn't already obvious, YouTube is powered by MariaDB, as is most of Google, I guess. So, so it re realistically, I should say it has recently added MySQL 5.6 support. It comes with a Python client interface. It also allows you to rewrite um, SQL qu queries. It can do range-based sharding either horizontally or vertically. And you back it basically either via something like etcd or zookeeper. And the cluster view is generally always up to date. And then you use the proxy for query routing. It is also now extremely easy to use. It has extremely good documentation. And if you go to vitesse.io, you can actually just roll it out in Kubernetes relatively quickly. You just need to enter your credit card details. We've all heard the term fail whale. And I guess Twitter was the one that actually had this image of a fail whale. And you realize that Twitter, it started on MySQL. It's still on MySQL. You just need to evolve your MySQL usage over time. They, then, they built things like Gizzard for sharding, which they have now obviously deprecated. Then they went on to, to build their data center operating system called Apache Mesos. And then they said, look, we need to manage MySQL in Mesos as, as a resource. Then they went on to build Apache Cotton. And the good thing about Twitter building all this and donating it to the Apache project is, even if the CEO decides that open source is not so important for them anymore and they don't want to dedicate engineers, I think last year they had a bit of a layoff, being part of an Apache project means other people are also contributing to it. So Cotton and Mesos are extremely alive and kicking. Then, who remembers Dig? Dig.com. It's like Reddit before Reddit, right? Maybe. I don't know. I don't use Reddit. Anyway, Dig started on MySQL. They migrated to Cassandra. And there were all these great blog posts by the DBA as to why they were migrating. And it turns out that they just didn't understand how to index very well. So they migrated to Cassandra. They pissed off their users. Then they migrated back to MySQL with indexes. But at this point in time, I guess they lost a whole bunch of users. So I guess you know the, one of the key takeaways of database failures and not understanding your database well and you know, not maximizing its strengths and minimizing its weaknesses is that this can actually cause loss to business, loss to your income, loss to people's happiness, and so forth. Security. Security is becoming kind of a big deal. I think if you read the newspapers, you always think, hey, there's, you know, someone got broken into again. Just this past week, the Philippines voter data leaves 55 million Filipinos at risk. You can download a 338 gigabyte MySQL dump, get lots of email addresses, and passport numbers of overseas Filipinos who are allowed to vote. This cannot be a good thing for most people, right? So this is voter data. It's a good thing they at least don't you know, store as to who you voted for, right? Because then they can probably do political persecution. Ashley Madison was just last year. Names, street addresses, email addresses, phone numbers, credit card transactions of over what, 36 million accounts. There were 9.6 million credit card transactions, including credit card numbers that are still valid. 6.9 gigabyte compressed dump. Lord knows how many marriages broke up because of Ashley Madison. And you know, the worst part is they're probably just chatting up bots, right? Uh, not that I'm advocating for Ashley Madison, just, just to be clear. I just feel bad for them. Patreon. Um, if, you were, if you were kind enough to donate to either open source projects and so forth, they got hacked not long ago as well. Nearly 14 gig dump, 99 tables, lots, of, lots and lots of information actually you know, put out as well. Happy to say, Mossack Fonseca's Panama Papers, this must be pretty famous in all newspapers now, right? They took out 2.6 terabytes worth of data due to WordPress and Drupal bugs. So I'm happy to say they were running a fork of um, 
Oracle's HTTP server, which is Fork of Apache, and they decided that MySQL wasn't good enough for them, so they ran the Oracle database. <laughs> so um, this is not a database part, but you know, 2.6 terabytes of data traveling out of your network and you don't notice it? Seriously? So while I can't tell you to update all your applications, I can at least try to help you maybe prevent SQL injections. The free version is the version on the top, and then the, the, the bottom version is the non-free version, the MySQL Enterprise Firewall, which has intrusion detection now already. It blocks SQL injections, you know, it blocks traffic, builds whitelists and so forth. But you're unlikely to use it because you know, I think you have to, it starts at $5,000. I mean, I'm unlikely to use it as well. I mean, you go get a 30-day trial version. But the good news is that MaxScale keeps on improving its database firewall filter, so you can now even configure things like rule matching. You can, you know, log matching queries. You know, it's really hard for you to parse SQL with regular expressions, so we obviously have to write a database firewall filter that is not that. But if you know regular expressions, it helps you then write front ends to it which will allow you to then extend the MaxSQL database firewall filter. Now, another thing. So, Philippine voter data and, you know, Ashley Madison. Imagine, you know, how many marriages having encryption at rest would have, you know, saved Ashley Madison users. MariaDB Server 10.1 has had, gives you the option of either having encryption on a per table basis or we want you to encrypt the entire table space now, when we thought about this, we thought there were many ways to do this, you know. Oh, actually, to be extremely fair, we didn't think so hard about it. Google thought about this. Google runs fully encrypted MariaDB. They not only give you HTTPS, all your user data is also encrypted, and the keys are stored on a key server. So this is actually really good for you. And Google contributed the patch and fix back to us, and which is why we integrated it. So to be fair, they thought a lot about this as well. Um, column encryption within an app. You, you know, en en encrypt individual columns uh, for, from the app or the ORM, then you lose direct access to SQL. You can also encrypt it via middleware. MyDiamo uh, actually wraps engines in ODB and MyIZAM, but if you use any of the other engines, it doesn't work. CryptDB uses client-server uh, proxy as well. And there's the other option of using dmcrypt. You know, why don't you just encrypt the entire file, file system? You get a huge chunk of CPU overhead, especially when you're retrieving pages and putting it into a buffer pool. It needs decryption. Same for logs. So the idea here was to make it extremely foolproof and to make sure that the attacker not only has to steal your data, but it also has to access your internal key management systems. And naturally, the design also focused on building um, ro key rotation so you can rotate the keys and then scrubbing data to get rid of the data that was already encrypted. So we encrypt everything. We can encrypt everything that touches the disk, including bin logs, temporary tables, temporary files. So MariaDB makes use of the ARIA storage engine for temporary tables. This allows you to encrypt that as well. Now, of course, we do provide a key management plugin on the file system. Now, if you're storing your key on the file system, if you get broken into, they take the key with it, so it's not very useful, right? So we highly recommend you using some kind of key management system that you have. So we also provide a fairly useful key management solution called the Amazon KMS plugin. You can get this in stock MariaDB today. And you will have to pay Amazon, obviously, a certain sum of money, but it'll actually ensure that key management happens on Amazon servers. And if someone does break into your database, and if they can't quite get access to the keys, they'll just get encrypted data. So no more credit card numbers being shown and so forth. So don't do key management on the file system. Definitely use a key management system. And the cheapest option is Amazon KMS. There are many other options probably available to you as well. Of course, there are some caveats. So one of the famous things is, um, you know, if you lose your encryption key, we can't recover the data. This also means that uh, we need to make MySQL bin log work with encrypted bin logs so that it can pass bin logs. So now we have to add server hooks to that. 
And if you happen to use Galera cluster, which is now integrated into MariaDB Server 10.1, we don't encrypt the Gcache, so there's still some data leak there. But if you're using you know, semi-synchronous replication or asynchronous replication, this is not a, a huge deal for you. And MySQL 5.7 GA'd two days after we GA'd last year. But only this year did they include in encryption for InnoDB table spaces. So they're adding new features into GA releases. Kind of shocking. Now, um, their recommended uh, key management solution is the Oracle key management solution, Oracle KV. They ship that plugin, but you'll have to pay for that as well. So all things considered, I think we have pretty good um, encryption. And uh, we've probably got a more well thought out version of encryption because it encrypts everything, including the logs. So. In conclusion, I think it's really worth to you know learn from others, um, learn from others' failures so that you don't have to repeat them yourselves. So one key takeaway is definitely use semi-sync replication you know with a failover solution that ensures you don't fail over too often. This is probably really important. You want to always make good backups. RSync is not a good way to make good backups. Then you want to test your backups. You, you want to test the restore. Um, you know, sometimes you want to do logical backups. MySQL dump is still great for logical backups. Also, you want to save your backups somewhere else so you don't do like a RM-RF and go, huh? You most definitely need to shard your data at scale. You're not going to be running on one master and one slave. So use proven fra frameworks. Maybe get even a proxy involved. Most large scenarios do get proxies involved. You want to complete backups? You can make use of multi-source replication when needed if you really felt that that was something you, you needed. Get all your shards, your masters, writing to a single slave and then doing backups or you know, real-time analytics or whatever you want to do. I, I would definitely use MySQL dump and extra backup together because sometimes not snapshot backups are great, but you also want to get logical backups. And there have been extreme speed up improvements from the web scale SQL tree to make MySQL dump much faster as well. And then if you want to do parallel backup and restore, there's a tool called MyDumper. MyDumper has been around for many years. You can totally use that. And lately, MySQL in 5.7 has released in, in, in its utility spec something known as MySQL Pump that's aimed to compete with MyDumper. It's a lot newer, your mileage will vary. Also, I think uh, security is extremely key. So you want to you know, prevent SQL injections. You want to keep your apps up to date. And you know, today, there is next to no reason not to encrypt data at rest. I mean, in all our tests, we see no more than a 5 to 7% decline in performance uh, when you're running encryption. And you're not running your database servers at 90% capacity most of the time, I'm sure. Now, the very large user running it in production basically says that they don't even see a 1% hit on their workload. So you know, your mileage will completely vary. Also, it's 2016. You don't want something like this to happen to you. So this is Malaysia Kini. It's a website that's been going on for 16 years. It pr gives you alternative, independent news that may be opposition-centric in Malaysia. And just a couple of weeks ago, they said that you know, they could not update their website because they had a hardware failure on their database server. And they also couldn't access the database and couldn't recover the database, and the backups were not usable. So they were not testing their backups. They um, obviously had some fault. And they decided, this is a subscription service, by the way, and they decided that the best way to move publishing would be to publish on Facebook for subscribers. So you don't want this happening to you in 2016. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for listening to me. And I'm open for some Q&A. Hi. Um, I've got a question here. Any uh, opinions on uh, AWS Aurora? Right. Opinions on AWS Aurora. So for one, it doesn't make use of many of these logs. And they actually have changed. 
the way my, uh, MySQL and MDB works. They've actually forked MySQL, and they have a fairly old fork at the moment. I think it's a 5, 6, 10 fork. And um, they've, they've actually basically got you writing to the disk layer much sooner. So you remove all the optimizations that MySQL 5, 6, and MariaDB 5, 3 provides. So there's no more disk based, join based optimizations. They disable all that to then stripe to three servers, uh, at, the, at the very least, if I'm not mistaken. Now, it's, it obviously has a lot of memory pressure, so it only works on very large instances. If you try it out on a small 15 gig instance, you'll actually see heavy memory pressure when you're doing benchmarking. We have heard people using it in production, but I guess the one thing that I'm not so happy with is that you can't take it off Amazon when you want to, down the line. And we find that more often than not, people start with RDS, and then they move to ho their own self-hosted MySQL variant on EC2, for example. And we, we don't know how long, or, uh, you know, how long one Aurora is going to be around and how interested this will be going forward as well. And it's still a 5.6, not moved to 5.7 yet. So my opinion on Aurora is mixed. But since we're recording a video, I, I, know, I can't say also too much because we work with Amazon. <laughs> so... Um, they, they pay us for the you know uh, Java connector and load balancing and stuff and a whole bunch of other things. So I don't want to offend them in any way, but you know Aurora, you know it's your choice to use if you want. But I would go with you know RDS or you know regular MySQL variant that you host yourself personally. Hello, yeah. uh, great talk and it was really informative. So uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on. Uh, the factors to be considered while moving from a managed MySQL service like we use Google MySQL service to a, our own uh, uh, MySQL cluster built on top of uh, infrastructure as a service, or VMs. So what are the factors to be considered? Because currently we use that and it, we feel it's very costly, but uh, there is some doubt whether like it's too, uh, whether the management complexity will be too high once we have it. Like. Uh, to be frank, like before your talk, I was more confident towards doing it ourselves, but now I see like there are a lot of options and a uh, lot of choices to be made. Like for us, doing this for MongoDB sharding plus replication was easy. Uh, it may not be that good reliable replication, but choices were less. There was only a default scheme to do it and we did it. But here there is a lot. So I wanted to get your more detailed thoughts on that. Sure. So yeah, my, my intention was not to scale but to realize that MySQL is now you know, more than 21 years old. This year it'll be 22 in May. It, it has a lot of solutions built around it, so there's lots of history around it. Moving off something like Cloud SQL or RDS or some hosted instance is something you do generally once you've grown past the limits. I mean, if you start RDS, for example, by default, you can only start 40 instances, right? So by the time you're like at 20 instances, you need to actually now tell them, look, I want you to upgrade my account. So you have to take these things into consideration as well. So moving off, say, Cloud SQL, it's not actually complex. I mean, they allow you to do dumps, and then you can restore it later as well. Um, but you do definitely want to think about having some kind of person with some kind of DBA knowledge. And um, you know, it really depends on what other features you end up using from the from Google's um, set of features. So you know, we go back to the Amazon option. Let's say you use RDS, but you may also use some kind of caching service that Amazon offers. This now means you are going to manage your own caching service, right? So you, this means either you install Memcached, you install Redis by yourself, and now you're managing that as well. So I, I do get that it's costly as you scale, but you realize that you're probably using a lot of these services that you know, you don't have to think about, which is why they, you, you pay them money. So moving just, say, MySQL off Cloud SQL should be relatively easy, but you also want to make sure you build the caching layer. You also want to make sure you obviously configure your, you know, MySQL config well. That's one thing that the cloud kind of abstracts. You don't have to configure it so much. You are allowed to configure bits and pieces, but most of it is kind of configured for you. Um, you know, running with a default config is like the greatest way to see lots of pain in the MySQL world. Uh, so yeah, I, I think some level of DBA experience is important, um, and it shouldn't be a problem for you to migrate. We see lots of people migrating off um, hosted services. 
some due to cost, some due to just overgrowing the service. And I'm happy to talk to you about you know this offline as well. I'm sorry, we have time only for one more question. All right, one more question. Excuse me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh. In my article, <laughs> I suppose so. So uh, uh, my well, question is on. Uh, who's, I don't know who's speaking. Which one of you speaking? I'm. I'm here you. speaking. <laughs> okay. I'm speaking. So. Uh, uh, what would be the best way to compress data in MySQL? Do you have any uh, compress recommendations? Data. Yeah, so a good way to compress data. So if you're using InnoDB, naturally you know it's a balanced V plus tree, and B, B trees are not known for their you know, great compression. You can obviously compress with InnoDB, but it's not going to be great. But there are other engines that actually do better compression. That is TalkUDB. TalkUDB, you know, can do 90% compression. It's, it, it claims to do, you know, maybe even 12x sometimes better than uh, InnoDB. And TalkUDB is obviously an engine that we ship in MariaDB and Pagona server as well. So you could try that for compression. And that one makes use of fractal tree indexes. But then you give away some things. Like TalkUDB doesn't allow you to use foreign keys. So you can't just alter your table away. You gain compression, but you lose foreign key support. And then the new upcoming engine that I would say is kind of hot is known as MyRox, which is based on RoxDB. And that one also has pretty amazing compression as well. So that may be something that you use in the future. But at the moment, if you, you use 5.6 or 5.7 or a modern MariaDB, you realize that there is InnoDB compression now, but it's just not great. Yeah. Do I get that other question, or are we done? <laughs> We're done. Okay, um, for the other chap, you can see me here. Thank you very much. <laughs>